a few announcements. This evening at 6 o'clock is our annual corn roast. That will be up at the pavilion. We provide the corn and the drink and the condiments. If you want hot dogs or hamburgs or you want s'mores, you have to bring them yourself. But we have the corn and the condiments. And uh, if you want to help prep the corn or if you've seen the pile of brush up there, the, the bonfire is going to start about five or earlier because it needs to burn down before you can get anywhere near it. Um, but anyhow, uh, about five o'clock, if you want to help remove some of the stuff, getting the corn ready to go, uh, you can come then. But otherwise, it's at six o'clock um, up there at the pavilion. If you want to bring your own lawn chairs to be comfortable, uh, feel free to bring those. Not in your bulletin, but this coming Saturday is uh, Dick and Stephanie Eimer's 50th anniversary. And we are having a reception here outside, uh, weather permitting, from 2 to 4. Um, it's kind of a low-key event. You don't, you don't need to bring any gifts. It's going to just be some cake and drink. You can come and go between those hours of 2 and 4. And uh, it'll be outside on this side, weather permitting, and inside if, if not. A reminder, the trustees, you have your regular meeting this Tuesday. There's agendas out in the entryway. School starts this week around here. So on Tuesday, the kindergarten through second grade goes to school. Wednesday, third to sixth grade. And... Uh, then the rest, then the preschoolers don't start till next week, but you can keep the teachers and students in prayer as they start this new school year in a, in a different way. A um, couple other things coming ahead for the young people. Bethany Camp has a 612 event coming up the last Saturday of the month, the 26th. Cost is $30. If you're going with our group, we need to have you registered by next Sunday so we can make arrangements transportation-wise, and, and those kinds of things. And then typically our state fellowship has a ladies' conference that same weekend. And this year they're offering it as a virtual conference. It's something that can be done individually. You can go online to the Northeast Fellowship and sign up and, and participate in that way, or they, there may be something more organized here. But though it's not a live feed so much as the the conference will be available for a two-week time period in there where if you register and get the codes, you can go on and participate in that. So just that opportunity for the ladies in a little different way also. Any other announcements that need made this morning? We welcome all of you here this morning. Look forward to a, a good time of, of worshiping the Lord together. I give you the update that Tom Menser did come home this week. He's still in a great deal of pain and has some other difficulties, but he is home at least at the moment, and uh, so you can keep uh, that family in prayer. If you'll turn in your hymnals to page 624, we'll say, Count Your Blessings, 624.
Scripture reading comes from Proverbs 22 this morning. Proverbs 22, verses 17 to the end of the chapter. Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you, have I not written 30 sayings for you, sayings of counsel and knowledge, teaching you true and reliable words, so that you may give sound answers to him who sent you. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their cause and will plunder those who plunder them. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. For you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Do not be a person who strikes hand in pledge or puts up security for debt. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched under you. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up, your for, set up by your forefathers. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. So a reminder there, among other things, of our accountability to God and our different relationships and responsibilities, the wisdom and instruction he gives us that we need to, to heed and to work in such a way that we honor him in our work environment. And we'll be looking at 1 Peter 2 today in, in a message that talks about uh, being conscious of the Lord and how that affects how we work and live in our different circumstances. We have special music at this time by Earl Freeman. I like this, I get to carry my own mic these days. Uh, the song I'm going to sing this morning I think is very appropriate for what's going on. Uh, most of you over 50 will recognize this. It's an old Carol Robson song. But it was actually sung the best by Elvis Presley, who was actually noted for his gospel music long before he became famous. <clears throat> anyway. Those hands are so strong, so when life goes 
what's wrong. Put your faith into one pair of hands. One pair of hands heal the sick. One pair of hands raise the dead. Page 639. Work for the night is coming. 639 in your hymnals. to give you a Labor Day hymn, right? Labor Day weekend. You have to sing about work. You all love your work, right? Yes, we know Arlene loved hers. Just a reminder, we don't pass an offering plate. There are plates available at the back of the church or a collection box on the wall. You're welcome to put your gifts in there as you deem appropriate. There's also no nursery or junior church. Um, we do have rooms where uh, parents can go with their own children if they want, both in this corner room here or straight back that hall to the nursery area where there's uh, speakers there if you feel that it's necessary to 
and, and some of the younger ones will transition to that period here shortly. But uh, those opportunities are available. And um, also, people are beginning to return enough. I discovered today we didn't make enough bulletins. So we had more at the early service and more at this service. And uh, so we'll try to remedy that going forward. But we're thankful that uh, people are able to, to get out and enjoy these different activities. Any prayer requests or matters of praise you want to share before we look to the Lord in prayer? Okay. Sometimes those little things that are taken care of make a big difference, don't they? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad to have my son John home and wife and my grandson. Okay. Yeah, once you start, you have to keep going around the whole circuit. <laughs> I, uh, I'd just like to say that Pete and I got some good news a couple weeks ago. My son and daughter-in-law are going to have a child in the And so between the two of us, now she's a little older than I am, but, uh, but no, between the two of us, we, have, we will have 10 grand. Okay. Good. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out into our lives as we have sung about that. And we sometimes take so many things for granted and, and we stop and thank you for children, for grandchildren, for the ability and health to work, the opportunity to worship together. And Lord, even for some of the trials and difficulties in life that stop and cause us to think and reflect on what's important and what is valuable, we do lift up before you those that are facing some challenges. We think of a Tom and some of his physical needs and pray that you will encourage him this day. We continue to lift up Don and Brenda Pamula and uh, he goes for CAT scans to examine where his cancer is at this stage. Uh, that you will continue to minister and encourage them. Lord, we thank you for your word and the clear instruction it gives us about life and of godliness and the blessings that you desire to pour into our lives. We thank you for the help that's provided by neighbors and friends and other individuals that just help take care of some of the little circumstances in our life. And we pray today that as we come here, our minds would be turned to you. We'd be conscious of all that you've done for us, of our responsibility to you, and that we would listen and respond in obedience to your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand together with me, we'll sing some worship songs, starting with Here I Am to Worship. <clears throat> Beauty that made 
God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunities we have today to love one another and to be loved by you. And it's because you first loved us while we were yet sinners and that you died for us that we can give our lives uh, up to one another, giving our desires, even our needs sometimes, uh, to love other people. One of the most difficult things to do, and yet you did it so well. And we're such a good example. And so we pray. That you would forgive us for failing, encourage us to repent, encourage us to forgive, and encourage us to be faithful and persevere 
and loving one another because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our main text today is 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25. And passages like this, passages that deal with slavery, give us a great deal of difficulty in understanding and applying to our circumstances. One reason for that is the connection with the type of slavery in American history. Uh, people were treated as property, not persons, and in the process, Scripture was often used to justify that type of enslavement and, and abuse. Uh, also, our own lack of connection with slavery in our current circumstances. We see cases of that in the news and other things, but it's not something that's a part of your uh, daily life and experience. Our problem is also amplified any time the word submit shows up in Scripture. Uh, because in America, we don't like the idea of submitting to anyone or anything. And so the minute that word shows up, we kind of shut off our minds sometimes as to what our responsibilities are. And again, uh, those scripture passages have often been used to justify oppressive or abusive conduct when it comes to the word submit. But in understanding the time that Peter's writing, slavery was the basic element of the economic system of the Roman Empire and Greek world. Uh, at least a third, if not more, of the population uh, lived in what would have been called, in their terms, slavery. Uh, in fact, you had subsistent living. If you weren't somebody's household servant, you probably weren't able to even survive very well because uh, you just didn't have the means of, of living in that setting and culture. But it's also a reminder, it wasn't usually a permanent condition of life. It was a, de a temporary condition on the path to freedom. It would be a little bit more like what we might think of as indentured servants. Now, it wasn't true in all cases, but in American history, if people were coming to America, they often, someone else would pay their passage over here, and they would become a servant of that individual for a certain amount of years, up to seven years sometimes, of an indentured servant status, and then they would be set free. And that was somewhat the road that often went uh, with what were slaves in the Roman Empire, although many of them came to that position because of, of the wars that went on, and they became captives and were brought in and, and put in those circumstances. But it clearly was still a, a position that was easily subject to, to abuse, and the uh, misuse of people. And yet at the same time, you need to realize slaves in the Roman Greek Empire were as broadly mixed as the rest of the population. They were often highly educated. Uh, they were the teachers of the students. They managed households. They ran businesses. Uh, they were the advisors to people, often having much more education than the people who had the ownership over them. They had many basic rights. Most of them could marry, they could own property. Some of them even owned their own servants. Um, some were just day laborers, and many were, but others held uh, great positions of prestige, and it was an honorable thing to be the servant of a person in high position. And, and so it was a very basic part of the day-to-day -day economic business. The closest application of this passage to our lives is our attitude and response in the workplace, or for the young people, it might be in your school environment as you're into that school setting. What is your responsibility and response? Uh, Peter has been emphasizing when you come to know the Lord as your Savior, you ought to live for Him in your current circumstances. Your circumstances may not change. It's not your initial goal to change. The change ought to be your consciousness of God will affect the way you live in the very same environment that you had been before. And Peter was very much aware of the class distinctions, of the suffering and injustice that was going on, 
the social exclusion, the abuses that were a part of this environment. So he's addressing people as to how they were going to respond in the midst of those kinds of challenging circumstances. And Peter stresses that it's the Christian's new awareness of God and what pleases him and his or her sense of calling in Christ that will inspire them to do what is the right thing to do even in difficult and sometimes painful circumstances. So in 1 Peter 2, 18 and 19, it says, Slaves, submit to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. So our title comes from that last phrase of that section, Conscious of God. So an awareness of God, of, of his presence, of his will or his instructions for our life. For a Christian, a relationship to God is the most important relationship and it guides all our other relationships in life. And so we're to perform our daily task with a personal integrity that is ultimately accountable to God. Uh, and we want to glorify God in our current circumstances. And that's one of the things, the phrase that's kind of come out off and on is, you're a walking advertisement for God. And that includes in your work setting and your, and your other circumstances. So how are you going to respond? Well, it says it starts with the consciousness and awareness of that I'm living before the Lord and I'm accountable before the Lord. And so in this work setting, the basic responsibility is to submit. That word means to place oneself under, to live under order or authority. Uh, and again, in our application, we need to understand in their setting, servants were in an employment relationship with their master. It's a far different setting than ours, but that was their work environment. That was how they were going to operate on a daily living, earn their living, and be able to sustain their families in that setting. And so the stress is we want to honor the Lord through obedience. We're to be submissive to those who are in authority over us. And notice what it says, whether they're kind or not. You all have wonderful bosses, right? You love going to work because you just look forward to seeing your boss. Maybe you're your own boss, and that's the worst part of it. But we submit because it's God's will and because through such obedience, we're a witness to God's grace and a testimony of what God expects in such a way, you need to recognize God holds the authorities over you accountable for how they handle their authority. Now, Peter's not emphasizing that. You can see that in Colossians and Ephesians and other passages. Uh, but Peter's emphasizing you as a worker or as a student, how are you going to respond to people in authority? Now, most of us today in a work environment have some kind of contract. So to submit means that our actions and behavior will be consistent with our worker's contract with our employer. It may not always be in print. One of the worst things about a pastor's job, you don't have a good job description. Everybody has an idea what the pastor ought to do with his time. And, uh, and you, it's one of those jobs that's never done. So you have to decide what's important and, and where, what am I expected to do with my time? And uh, maybe some people have a better job description than I do, I don't know. But uh, that's one of the challenges in that setting. But we have to conduct ourselves consistent with the obligation that we've taken on. We desire to do God's will and our conduct ought to be consistent with the obligation we assume in relation to that person or to that job. And our conduct is determined by the relationship, not by the personality traits or the way that person operates in their leadership role. You all know that wonderful law that people rise to their level of incompetence. People keep going up and they get to a position where they're in authority and some people it goes to their head. And they, they were great in this job. You move them up a step, they abuse their authority, they become hard to work for. It, it has, if you find yourself there someday, be gracious enough to bump yourself down a notch. 
for the sake of the people under you and your sake. You're better off to be in a position where you do what you do well and love doing it than be in a position where you you and nobody else are happy about where you're at. But our conduct ought to be consistent with that obligation, and it's determined by the relationship, not the, re, the personality traits. And when we disregard our relational contract or obligations, we do a disservice to the gospel. You are representing the Lord in your workplace, and you don't represent him well when you don't fulfill your obligations. Now, it's not just about that part. There's also an emphasis that begins about your attitude in the workplace. It says you ought to do this with all respect. Do you respect authority? You know, scripture emphasizes a lot of authorities are in place, but God, God placed them there. Uh, we changed the order this week a, a little bit from where we would normally. Next week, you get to learn about what Scripture has about your relationship to government. Isn't that going to be fun in the current environment? How are you handling your response to authority? And, and what's that look like in a constitutional government of America? So that's an advertisement for next week. Just threw that in there a little bit. But, um, see, it says you ought to exercise respect for, because of the position of authority and also out of reverence for God and His working in your life and circumstances. You're in the place you're in because the Lord has something for you to learn and maybe providing an opportunity for you to impact the person over you as you represent the Lord well in those circumstances. Now, some employers are fair and reasonable. Uh, my son-in-law changed jobs, one of my son-in-laws, five or six years ago, and he loves his new work environment. The old one, he dreaded going to work. He didn't like his work. He didn't like the boss. I had another son-in-law who basically, when they got a new boss over him, drove everybody out. He hung on to the end and was the last one to leave under that, that person in that position. Um, but, boy, you can get some great employers. You can get some really tough employers. So some employers are fair and reasonable. Others are awkward to deal with. They're unfair. They're even, sometimes seems like they're out to get you. And one of the other dangers in the American setting is this. There's a lot of big companies out there. And big companies are very impersonal. And big companies can be driven by corporate greed. And in the process, it's easy for us to decide, well, they're a big corporation and it's, not, so it's all right to not do things the right way. See, all respect is an emphasis that you ought to transcend the norms of just the society around you. Not doing the bare minimum, not serving with a disgruntled attitude, but you're a consistent, faithful worker. And he's stressing here, it's only a realization of the presence of God and how he can use even difficult, unjust, uh, tough situations that can make your task meaningful, even when you feel you're being misused and just treated like a servant. And so that's part of that, the challenge of the attitude in that process. The second thing that's emphasized in this passage is this picture about not just that you're conscious of God and you're submitting authority, but that you want to please God. Again in verses 19 and 20 says it, For it is commendable if a person bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it? To your credit, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and enduring it, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. You can do the right thing and still be treated unfairly. Happens all the time. Didn't you ever tell your kids, life is not fair? <laughs> you know, they, they love to say to you, it's not fair! They've never heard that from you, have they? No, it isn't fair. But that doesn't change your responsibility. Uh, the danger is that we use other people's misconduct to justify our own. Doesn't that sound like the headlines right now? 
things happen that shouldn't happen. It's appropriate to take certain action, but when you begin to justify your own misconduct because of what other people do, Peter says, hey, when you get in trouble for that, you deserve it and you ought to expect it. And you ought to learn from it. Don't make the same mistake again. When we face the consequences of our misconduct, that's nothing commendable. That's what you should expect to see happen. But to remain a God-honoring worker in difficult situations, such as pleasing in God's eyes because of an expression of, of grace, you are a recipient of God's grace. You receive better than you deserved. Your boss or employer ought to be a recipient of God's grace through you. That even when they don't deserve what you're doing, you do it in a way that honors God and is an expression of grace. It's our responsibility to be a faithful worker, a cooperative and uncomplaining worker, even if we don't think things are fair and receive unfair treatment. Now, let me stop for a moment and say to you, it's appropriate to send grievances through the proper channels. It's appropriate if illegal things are being done in a work environment to point out those things. It's appropriate to change jobs. If you, you know, you don't have to stay in a horrible job. You have great flexibility today that a lot of other people have. So, so these terms of submit aren't used to justify wrongdoing. But they are challenging you about your attitudes and actions and response in circumstances that you often see as unfair. So don't use other people's misconduct as an excuse for your own misconduct. If we suffer as a result of fulfilling our obligations properly but keep on persisting, such suffering, the Lord says, I know you're doing the right thing, and I'm going to honor that. And the reward of such attitude and conduct is the commendation of God himself. And you're testifying to God's grace, and you're allowing God to use you. You're serving him by the way that you are responding in those circumstances. Now the challenge gets even tougher when you get down to verses 21 to 25 because he says you're also called of God to conform to Christ's example. And one of the challenges, you know, like the fairy tales, we often think, you know, they, they got married and lived happily ever after. We sometimes say, well, I got saved and I lived happily ever after. You see what God called you to? To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled the insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. See, part of being called to Christ is you may be called to suffer for him. He says, Jesus Christ's example is one of unjust suffering. Uh, he did the right things. And he suffered even to the point of death on the cross. Notice Jesus' responses were without sin. He didn't retaliate. He didn't threaten. He did the right thing and he entrusted himself to God. That, that's an important phrase to be able to think about. Do the right thing and leave the results in God's hand. And you might not like what goes on in the meantime. But do you trust God enough to do the right thing and leave the results in his hands? And he says, Jesus is your example of that. Now, Jesus is far more than an example, and that's what it emphasizes next. Do you realize what Christ has done for you? If Jesus was, not un if Jesus was unwilling to suffer unjustly, you would never be saved. Now, whose sin did he bear on the cross? You know, he bore your sin on the cross. He bore my sin on the cross. That's the emphasis he here. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. The value and effects of Christ's suffering for us. Dealing with our sins because of, we have a new life, a new relationship where he's at the center of all that we do. And we can enjoy the, the blessings and, and recognize that he's pleased when we act appropriately whether anybody else is or not. And in fact, it kind of comes to the end of this passage in verse 25. says, For we were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. In other words, he's the guard, guardian and guide of my life, and I'm going to let him give me the direction and know that he's looking out for my well-being. Therefore, I can do what he calls me to do, even when it's difficult. See, do you have confidence in the righteousness and the vindication of God? That he will ultimately set things right. Might not happen right now. But I'm going to conduct myself appropriately in light of that. We're to live and work redemptively in our vocations because of our relationship to the Lord. We have great freedom and privilege in our country. Our work environment has a lot of built-in protections. Why do we celebrate Labor Day? You know what the big push and initial part of Labor Day was? Obviously it's protection for workers, but a lot of it had to go to a 40-hour work week. And, you know, most before that, you know, you were working, isn't it interesting in our current environment, we're flipping, now people are often working 12-hour shifts and all sorts of created ways of doing work, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, but the setting is, you have a lot of protections that are built in, but there are always employees, employers and companies that will mistreat workers. And you may be in such an environment whether it's just one person who's your boss or whether you work for some big company. One of the other dangers is this. The people around you don't look at their work circumstances with a consciousness of God. And so in that process, what often begins to happen is workers cut corners, workers undercut authority, workers feel free to misuse the system because it's some big corporation or because they don't deserve it. And the pressure comes on you to do it like everybody else. So sometimes the pressure comes from that setting where as a Christian, I, I'm conscious of God, so how am I going to work? Our ultimate accountability is to God and we want to please Him and represent Him well in our workplace. That will mean having a reputation as a cooperative and hard worker, even in a difficult environment. Also that you act with integrity and will stand up for what is right and willing to suffer for even doing what is right. And in here he's reminding us, when you remember what Christ suffered to redeem you, then I'm willing to do what he calls me to do. I resolve to do the will of God, come what may, because I can trust him. I know how much he loves me. I know what he's done for me. And I'm in this circumstance for a reason. I want to respond appropriately. That we will follow the example of Christ living under authority in a God-honoring way, in a way that God can use for the benefit in your life and even for those over you. One of the interesting things that happened in the early Roman Empire is most of the higher up people who came to know the Lord as Savior did so because of the ministry of a slave in their household who lived for the Lord. It influenced the people above them. You sometimes don't think you have any influence above you. But when you live for the Lord and do it consistently, you can have a powerful impact for the cause of Christ. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for health and strength and abilities and the ability to work and the abundant provision that we have through our work. May we recognize that the opportunity to work and to go to school and these things are privileges that you provide for us and you place us in environments where we can influence others for you. May we live all of our life with a consciousness of your presence and your care for us and represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll turn your hymnals to page 496. We'll sing together, I Surrender All. 496. and those who are assisting would come at this time for communion. We are reminded...